Our next uh, speaker is Keith uh, Besserud from Skidmore's and Merrill, uh, architect and leader of Black Box, which is an applied research unit of the Chicago office. Um, and he's going to be talking about parametric pretension. So, Keith. All right. Need a swap yeah, here. Okay. All right. Let me, okay. Uh, Okay, I could have done that. And, uh, there you go. All right. Yep. Yeah, so um, I feel like I'm going to sort of bring things down now after, after that there a little bit. Um, <laughs> that got me going. That got me through the afternoon here. Um, hopefully I won't lose you. So, um, yeah, I, 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 what I'm going to talk about today is, is, is in some ways a much, much smaller kind of problem. This is not a grand aspirational story. This is, is, a, is kind of a down and dirty case study um, about uh, a process that we went through recently on, on this particular project that I'm going to talk about here. So this is um, King Abdullah. Well, so a little bit of introduction. I'm going to talk about some starting conditions of, of, of what uh, we were looking at when we got going and the workflow that we evolved and then some reflections about that. And, and basically it has to do with parametric design, parametric modeling and so forth, and, and what that means in practice in a, in a, in a case study. So the um, subject here is, is, uh, is a new city in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, about 100 kilometers north of Jeddah, called King Abdullah Economic City. It's one of these, there's multiple developments along these lines happening uh, where the government there is basically trying to diversify the economy from, from a, you know, a purely oil-based uh, economy into other, other ways. And um, to give you a sense of the scale, uh, th this is the, the city limits on the left and then that outline overlaid um, over New York and New Jersey there. So it's a fairly substantial project. Um, there is, um, there was an original master plan that was developed for the project and um, that was before the economic downturn and after the economic downturn um, they had to rethink things and that's when SOM was brought in uh, for the second go round basically. This is a picture of a model in the marketing center for, for this um, development uh, where they obviously bring people and developers and so forth to, to get a sense of what this opportunity is. And, and to engage them to, to, to develop uh, parcels. Um, this is the previous master plan design, and, and like I said, we were engaged after this happened to, to do a, a, a subsequent master plan. And what my story is about, actually, is not the master plan, but we were also engaged then to develop a digital model to support the creation of a new physical model. So that's, that's all this is really about. We're not looking to change the world or anything. I'm going to tell a story about trying to do a digital model in support of a physical model. But there's an underlying point that I'm going to, I want to bring forward at the end that I think gets revealed in this process that I think is really important. So, um, so the starting conditions. Um, this is what our master plan, our strategic master plan looked like um, that we delivered to them uh, I think it was in early 2013, about a year ago. Um, and what I want to make clear is what you can see is how little there is in terms of built stuff to look at, buildings in particular. Um, and because a strategic master plan is not an urban design. Um, a lot of people maybe don't quite understand that if you're not in the business, but um, at, at a, in the development of a strategic master plan, you're not actually designing all of the buildings. You're not getting down to a high level of resolution. It's, it's much more as the name suggests, strategic in nature. So for example, um, there's, there's ideas that, that, that worked into the strategic master plan that flowed out of aspirations for um, the development of open space and open space frameworks. And in this particular case, um, that had a lot to do with a, um, a feature called uh, a wadi, uh, or a system of wadis here, which are uh, stormwater, natural, you know, nature's version of a, a stormwater management system and trying to work uh, with that, that idea. Um, we had, there, there's a road framework that's developed, but, but only to a certain level of resolution. So these are sort of primary and secondary roads, but not really the finer grain of the neighborhood and, and, the, and the urban block level of, of street development. Um, land use is defined in very sort of gross terms. Um, so industrial, residential, commercial, or whatever, and, and not indicated within that as a finer grain of how the parcels individually get um, set in terms of how they'll be developed. Same thing for density, again, at a very gross level. So, um, and then, and the, uh, as well as some notions about how it would be phased out over time, potentially. And accompanying that is, is a, doc, a document um, that deals with 
um, guidelines for streets, for neighborhoods, for districts, and so forth. So set some, some, some rules in place, basically, for how this would want to develop over time in a responsible way that's in keeping with all of the, 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 the goals that were developed as part of the strategic master plan. So, so the idea is to go, for this particular exercise about building a model, is to go from, from where we were at this point to fleshing that out into to more of an urban design in a very short period of time. Um, so they, you know, they said, all we need is something so that we can build a physical model. You don't need to design it, it just needs to look good. Well, you can't really make it look good unless you go through that exercise of design, right? So we weren't engaged for design services, so to speak. We were engaged to, to, to support a model creation process. But it forced us into a, a, a process of design because we didn't want somebody else designing it, obviously. So, so ultimately to support some kind of creation of a model. And, 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 and obviously the challenge with, with a physical model is it's, it's a lot more difficult to, to, to uh, suspend disbelief, right? When you see that, that physical, when you see that building represented a certain way, you think, well, somebody designed that. And, and, and it's, in fact, it's impossible not to design it. So, so what it did is compress us into a very tight schedule to try to deliver a, a, a region that size, you know, designed to a, a point that we would feel good having our name on, on the model that everybody's going to see. So we had to improvise a workflow. Um, and one of the first things we talked about was the use of City Engine because um, we had been playing around with it. We, we weren't fluent with it by any stretch of the imagination yet, but we, we understood enough to know that there was some, you know, inherent benefits to working in a, in a parametric platform. Um, that might aid us in getting to this deadline in time. Um, we, we were also dealing with, because of, of the lack of, of skills in, in, or, or the specific skill set in the office, we were dealing with models built in, in AutoCAD, in, in Rhino, um, in 3D Max, as well as, as, as um, uh, City Engine. And then ultimately the, the client wanted the, the full model, uh, digital model delivered in Rhino. So, so those were sort of the, the, the rules in place to start with. And the first thing that we got into then was, was this, the, 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 the neighborhood streets, trying to design a street grid. Um, and that sounds easy enough, um, until, except when you're talking about the scale we're looking at. And, you know, typically we would spend a lot of time just, just looking at that particular issue. So this is, um, whoops, um, uh, you know, one small section of the entire city. We actually did full design on this piece as part of the, the strategic master plan. So it was one district area that we actually did spend the time. And, and, and we basically spent eight weeks just doing this when we had eight weeks to do the whole rest of the thing. But you can see you know, all of the finer grainer detail um, of the streets and so forth that we got into um, that we had to somehow replicate again going forward for the full, full city. And so we spent some time looking at, at, at the street network. This is in Jetta at, at various examples of, of what those things look like and trying to think, how do you take the patterns that you see in something like this and translate that into an algorithmic concept that you can deploy very quickly? So that was the idea. We wanted to try to have something that was um, an algorithm that we could quickly op you know, use to, to deploy the streets across the entire city. And the, the fellow that in the office, Neil Katz, that was working on that, has, has done a fair amount of this kind of thinking. Um, he's, he's a very talented scripter in AutoCAD Lisp. Um, and so one of the first things he started doing was looking at typologies of these neighborhood streets, let's say, and, and generated a whole bunch of variations on what those things might look like conceptually. And then sat down with the design team, <coughs> excuse me, and reviewed them to see what, what looked good, what might work, and in which ones definitely wouldn't. And so they culled all of these different ideas. And then, um, and, and, well, as, and as an example of, of what Neil, some of the things that Neil has done, um, and the reason we, we enlisted him here, this is an example of, a, of an algorithmic um, pattern making process, a tiling, where uh, he just recursively subdivides each quadrant into four new quadrants. And, and you do that over and over and over again. And, and you get some really beautiful patterns that emerge out of that. And the thought was, you know, maybe this isn't that different from trying to deploy a, a, you know, a, a network of neighborhood streets. <coughs> so this was a, a sort of a logic structure that he developed for it and, and attempted to, to do this. And, and what we found out that it, it was that there's, there's just a whole bunch of rules about the way that the streets come together, the way that they traverse across the site, where they start and stop. Um, and where they, um, you know, 
when, when, when one hits a, intersects with a street and another one comes into it, there's rules about how close to each other those can be. Should they be right across from each other? They can't be a little bit apart because that would be too close. They, you want them further apart. And there were just a lot of nuances there to try to capture in a, in a comprehensive program in order to deploy it in a way that looked convincing. Because we don't want total uniformity and we don't want total chaos either. It's that sort of sweet spot that looks good, right? So um, we had, I would say, limited success, success in trying to do this. And, and ultimately, um, most of the streets had to be reworked pretty substantially by, by hand because we couldn't, get, we couldn't get Neil to generate it in the way that the designer wanted it to look. And I'm going to talk more about that at the end because I think that's a significant thing when we start talking about parametric platforms and, and parametric design approaches. So the next step actually went very smoothly, thanks uh, in great part to Esri, uh, of, of taking the CAD data, which was organized on specific layers within, within AutoCAD, <coughs> and moving that into City Engine um, and getting it placed in the right way, organized in the proper way within City Engine, getting it to read the CGA files so that it could automatically generate the proper street widths according to the layer that they were on, and, and all of that actually worked very, very well. Um, the next step then was back again into design, and this time for the, the building masses. So again, looking at what, we was, what was generated for the Haramain um, district, and looking at somehow making that happen on a much larger scale. So the first thing um, we were, the, the person that was, our, um, that was running City Engine for us in the office was relatively new to it, and he started by simply taking the strategic master plan data and extruding that according to the polygons that were in there representing the different neighborhoods and districts. So the, the colors represent the different use type, the, the, the heights of the extrusion represent um, density. Um, so just in a very abstract way, starting to sort of get a handle on how the, the logic of City Engine works. We had also done some experiments earlier um, just with respect to, just as, as a test of, of the parametric potential, um, to try to develop an idea about a prototypical Chicago city block. Um, and so we developed these CGA rules that provided this ability to create a certain amount of randomness within a, a constrained um, idea was able to get it to recognize automatically when it was oriented towards a major street or a minor street and generate the, the building typologies according to that kind of data. And then a piece of the Chicago, um, uh, looking at, at, at Chicago from above and, and then how that particular rule set was actually pretty successful in, in mimicking what was going on in the Chicago, typical Chicago block. Um, we also, we, we, in, the, in the CAD file, Neil also generated polygons for the, the block areas um, and organized those on layer according to the use type. And so when that data came into City Engine, we could automate a process of, of City Engine understanding what type of use was on the block where it was going to instantiate some buildings and then um, do so according to those rules. And then further into the process, way too late, I think, and, and I'll talk about this at the end as well, um, actually got around to try and think about all of these different block types as typologies, very distinct typologies, and create rule sets which would, which would relate to those typologies. So here are five residential typologies, for example, and depend, depending on where they're deployed across the site, they get generated in different ways and orient themselves to the geometry of the block that they're sitting on. And there was, there was, you know, some success and, and some, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of um, hit and miss, I would say, in, in areas where, you know, strange things would, would start to show up um, because of information that was in the street center lines or, or, or other things that, that created, you know, unusual conditions. And, and this set up a lot of friction um, in the office, actually, with it, within the design team especially with, with the senior designers who weren't, who weren't engaged in the project on a daily basis, but sort of dropped in periodically to review things and, and to see things that looked absolutely ridiculous because they were auto-generated and the team hadn't had time yet to go back and edit those individual cases, um, really hurt us a, a good deal um, in terms of the credibility of, of this whole approach. Um, and, and it took a while to sort of get everybody understanding that, that this actually was a, a good way to try and do things. Um, so there's 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 a there's a cultural story there about the the you know the, the adoption of this kind of technology this way of thinking this this kind of approach to doing design, <coughs> and we're 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 facing that now. So in the, the you know we had review processes periodically, and it would involve printing out you know 
overview, you know, site plans of this entire development, pinning them on the wall, you can, you can see, I mean, just for scale, there's a couple of chairs there. You get an idea of how big, you know, this is. And, you know, trying to review something this large in scale on a computer screen, for example, is a really difficult proposition. Um, so we go back to sort of traditional ways of marking things up, having pinups and review processes to look at what's going on. And the senior designers, you know, start homing in immediately on, on little details and, and critical pieces that they say, this is just, you know, this isn't right, this looks ridiculous. We're gonna look stupid if this gets built this way, you know, these kinds of things. And um, it, it, it really presents some challenges. Um, and, and at one point, the, the, this WADI system um, that, that runs throughout the, the project, the, 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 the design partner felt it just didn't look wide enough. So this, this whole thing of making it look right um, said, we've got to widen all the WADIs. And, and this was a case, fortunately, where the parametrics helped us. So, so it was not that bad of a, of a, of a you know, difficult of a task to try to modify the model according to this, this one um, uh, improvement. But also little things like we, we, it took us a while to figure out how to, to, to print these things to a scale so that in these pinup sessions, somebody want to put a scale on and say, well, how big is this building or how wide is this block? And we were like, well, we don't know. And, and it's another just extremely fundamental thing that, that you want to be able to do um, as part of a, a design process here and, and it was difficult to do it. And then uh, we also had a number of, so there's a lot of mosques and, and school buildings and so forth, a lot of parks that were deployed um, throughout. And so obviously trying to generate those types of buildings procedurally was probably not something we wanted to do. So all of that was done in Rhino. Those were just imported in and then manually um, distributed across the, the project. But ultimately we got to the finish line um, and, and had a model that we felt comfortable with having represented in a physical way. And then sort of one last technical step was um, because of the scale of this thing, because of the size of the model, because we wanted to be able to feel, feed chunks of it to the model maker, the physical model maker, um, the, the whole thing was subdivided into to different sections um, as a way of organizing the information. And interesting little thing that that led to then was things like this when we put all the chunks back together and, and the, the streets don't reconnect from one chunk to another. So <clears throat> the final step was to, to take and, and regenerate the entire street network and then um, compile that with everything else. So we had a final model in, in Rhino that, that we delivered to the, uh, to the client. And they are now at this moment in the process of, of building this thing. Um, on site, and and we are still getting feedback um, from the client about could you change this or could you change that, um, and that's probably one of the biggest casualties of of this accelerated process compared to a, you know the process we would typically have is the is the the the, the timing of feedback um, not only from the client but also from the design partner and and, uh, and other people, um, and and so that was the, I think one of the the bigger challenges. Um, that we face. So I have a few reflections, um, a couple of notes to Esri, and, and first of all, thanks for all the support um, that we got in trying to pull this off. Um, and I'm not going to belabor that because I don't think any of this is, is hugely major things, but um, this idea of, of, of better means of supporting review processes, I think, would be um, you know, a nice thing to, to, to develop further. Um, we had this funny little thing with, with the, we used random a lot for, 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 you know, working with a scale like this in order to create, you know, sort of an organic quality to it. We, we, we relied on, on the random seed function a lot to, to create variety within, within certain bounds. And um, we never figured out until later how to fix the random seed so that every time you closed the project and opened it back up, it didn't regenerate a completely new design. So, <laughs> Um, so after the fact, we figured that out, but it would have been nice to maybe have better control of that. We had trouble with curved streets. Um, there were a number of sort of anecdotal things that happened with that. Um, this rendering in the background here is from 3D Max. Clearly from what we saw this morning, the, the rendering capabilities are getting better, but they're not at the level that, that we typically need um, for these types of projects. And I also wonder about the possibility of, of a, you know, we have this whole process of, of working in CAD at the beginning in order to lay out the streets. And the main reason is there's no good way in City Engine to have dimensional control over a, in a drafting environment, especially if it was a parametric drafting environment. I think that would be something very, very useful. 
Um, it, it's not really problematic at the moment because so few people work in City Engine and, and everybody works in CAD, so we could get a lot of people working in CAD initially and then just import it in, but I, um, I think that might be something worth happening. And, and like I said earlier, in the end, there was a whole lot of manual tweaking that happened um, you know, after all of the procedural work happened, uh, which I think is to be expected. So notes to self, um, and I think these are, are, are more critical uh, in terms of, of, of SOM getting adjusted to this kind of way of, of looking at, at doing um, design. Um, so I think, you know, designing within a parametric, you know, parametrically within a collaborative process requires buy-in from all the collaborators. You're basically setting up a game with a set of rules and you're putting yourselves somewhat in a box and everybody's got to be comfortable saying, we're, com we're comfortable with those constraints because the nice thing about it is we can exhaustively search that box once we've got the framework set up. But there are things outside of the box that your rules won't let you explore without some pain. Um, and that, that may not be easy to understand for people who haven't worked in this, this, this way of thinking yet, but um, trust me, the, the, it, it, it works that way. Um, and, and so I think that leads to the question of what's the right amount of parametric intelligence to, to build into the model. Um, at Doug's uh, presentation earlier, and it, relate, it relates to this idea of, you know, what's the right amount of detail? You know, how, how, much, how much do you need to automate um, versus still relying on, on sort of our, our manual tweaking and manual um, approaches to, to working with design? Um, and I think to a certain extent, it may be a formula for failure when the creation of the parametric framework is treated as a special, as a technical special, specialty distinct from the design process. Um, you know, so we have people that are skilled with these tools, but they aren't the lead designers. And so they're playing this game of interpretation, trying to interpret what the design intent is coming out of the mouth of the designers. And, and in fact, the act of creating a, 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 a parametric framework is the design process. Um, I would argue, and, and, and that's where the design really happens, is in the crafting of those rules and the, and the crafting of the game that you're trying to set up in the, in the design exercise. So, so to the extent that there's a cultural distinction between those two, I think, is, is a bad thing, and, and it, it exists uh, still, certainly for us. Um, we definitely should have spent more time hashing out the typologies in the, in, the, in the beginning. That would have saved us a lot of time in the end. That's another sort of truism for parametric work. You invest in that front end to make life better um, you know, downstream, and, and we didn't do an adequate you know, job of, of addressing that, I would say. And then um, you know, it would seem that, the, that the, the level of refinement called for at this scale, they're just massing models. They're not architecturally articulated models in, in any way. They're not architecturally designed. Would, would lend itself perfectly to this, I think, this approach in City Engine. Um, and, and in fact, when you look at our design guideline documents, you know, that stipulate things about the street design and about the design of blocks and, and the relationships of buildings to streets and all of this stuff, it's all very logically oriented. There's, a, there's very much an algorithmic quality to those, those paper design documents, and it should translate, I'm quite sure, very well into algorithmic recipes but we still haven't gotten there yet. We haven't been able to sort of um, invest ourselves sufficiently to, to pull that off, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident it's possible. So, and then I just want a note of thanks to the, the folks on our team, and as I said, uh, the folks at Esri that were, were helpful with us uh, sort of wading through this, so thank you. <laughs>